Good morning, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you being here. I'm joined by Alexis, Katie, and Jesse. Uh, we know how valuable your time is. Um, we know that there's lots of things that need to be done, uh, but we're here for that very reason, that time is valuable and time's running out. Uh, I refuse to allow Minnesotans to forget about their neighbors who are dealing with a crisis in access to insulin. Uh, those who may feel like they can run the clock out or those that may seem to think that people forget about this are sadly mistaken. This crisis is still upon us. We still have, and you're going to hear stories of young people, instead of looking to the future, are dreading when they turn 26 and fall off their parents' insurance and the implications that that makes. It's now been 568 days since the first Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act was introduced back in 2018 by House DFL Caucus. It's now been 150 days since the 2019 legislative session ended. 28 days since the Senate Republican Caucus released their plan. 21 days since the House DFL Caucus released their updated plan. And 16 days since I called them to come together and conference this. I received an immediate reply and the names of people to be on the conference from the House DFL. We, 16 days ago, named our three representatives, including Commissioner Harpstead, to that. I have yet to receive a reply. I sent a follow-up letter, and it has now been 15 days that I have not received a letter. Um, the deal has not come together. The uncertainty has gone on too long, and insulin is not optional. People with diabetes cannot go a single day without insulin, and those numbers should be telling. They are absolutely tragic that this is a situation where we now have a path forward. We have two competing plans. The way our system works is you come together, you work out a compromise, and you move that forward. Cost of insulin doubles over four years. We're forcing individual families to make impossible decisions, which you're going to hear. Too many families decide between the medication they need and the food and stable housing. Too many decisions to ration their insulin. Alex Smith Holt died June 2017, within a month of leaving his mother's insurance plan. Jesse Scherer Radcliffe died June 29th at 21 because he was rationing his insulin. The longer we take to come to a deal, people will lose their lives. Our young people should be looking forward to the future. They are not in the case of those who need insulin. Our seniors should be planning for hard-earned retirement, not delaying it so they can remain on employer-sponsored health care to make sure insulin is affordable. Time to act is now. Minnesotans need this certainty. We can't wait any longer, and it is absolutely clear they can use this room if they need to. It's as simple as finding the time to sit down together, work out the differences. We call a special session, we sign the bill, we move it forward, and we give certainty to the folks, to our neighbors. So uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Katie Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Katie Scott. I'm 24 years old and I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was just 22. At first, when I was diagnosed, in a way, I was relieved because I was so sick. But that relief would soon be diminished as soon as I found out how high the cost of insulin was and how much it was going to take just for me to live a normal lifestyle. Life in your 20s is, I'm going to be honest, unstable, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I'm still figuring out who I want to be as a person. And I'm really just figuring out what I want to do with my life. A little bit of background of the type of insulins I use. I use a mealtime insulin that I inject every single time before I eat. And I use a long-term acting insulin that I inject every single morning. I also use test strips, which are very expensive as well. But all of these three things are necessary in order for me to live a long, fulfilling life. I am on my parents' insurance still. Although being an adult, I can't always rely on my parents. Not to say that they aren't a great support system. It's just the reality that I live with. This is my reality. Even on my parents' insurance, I have been guilty of rationing my own insulin. I've had to choose between basic needs like putting gas in my car to get to the job that I need to afford my insulin or just buying insulin in general. My least favorite thing that I've ever had to choose between were buying one of the two different types of insulin or my test strips that I need in order to survive. 
Sometimes I've gone a few days without a certain type of insulin. Sometimes I've gone a week without test strips or two. I own my own yoga studio, but I also work a waitressing job and I work multiple jobs, like I had said prior, in order to keep up with my type one lifestyle. And I'm near the end of my parents' insurance, one and a half years to be exact. I'm running out of time. And right now, being type one with no insurance is a death wish. Some people will say that over-the-counter insulin or Walmart insulin is the answer to this problem. But Josh Wilkerson, age 27, just passed away this last June after switching to over-the-counter insulin in order to help pay for his wedding. My heart and my deepest condolences go out to him and his family at this time. Losing somebody so close to my age in the type one community has me wondering if I will share the same fate when I am off my parents' insurance as well. And I'm not the only one running out of time. Moving forward for things to change with the emergency insulin bill. There are over 300,000 diabetics in the state of Minnesota alone, and they are running out of time too. Thank you. And I would like to pass the mic over to Alexis. Thanks, Katie. You're welcome. Oof. Hi, my name is Alexis Stanley. I'm 20 years old, and I'm a junior at Concordia University in St. Paul. My life like to be my life used to be like a lot of you guys's. If you asked me a year and a half ago how I was, I would have been great. I'd be a healthy freshman in college, only worried about lacrosse in school. The only thing I was concerned about was what I was going to have for breakfast. I didn't skip out on groceries back then. I never had to contemplate whether I paid rent and got groceries or paid for my insulin. A year and a half ago, I wasn't fighting every day to stay alive. I was just living my life in my own hands, but not anymore. Since April 2nd of 2018, my life has been in the hand of legislators and greedy pharmaceutical companies. It's been 147 days since the Senate killed the Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act in the final hours of negotiation. It's been 28 days since the Senate announced their insulin assistance program. And it's been 26 days since Representative Jeremy Munson posted a video endorsing Walmart insulin as an alternative to using the insulin that our endocrinologists prescribe us, which I thought that video was a joke. Turns out it's not. He stands by that to this day. Something all these events have in common, though, is time. And nothing has been done during that time. Do you know who I wish still had time? Micah, Megan, Rachel, Jeremy, Kayla, Andy, Josh, Antavia, Jada, Alan, Jesse, and Alec. All of those people, except for Alec, died this year in 2019 from rationing their insulin or only being able to afford Walmart insulin. And the scary thing is, those are the only deaths that have been reported that I know of. If time keeps flying by like it has, it won't be long until I get put into many of their positions and get kicked off my parents' insurance and have to figure out a way to afford my life. Earlier this year, a family posted in a diabetes Facebook group reaching out in need of insulin because her husband had run out the night before. She was located in my hometown where my parents live, so I reached out. She explained to me while they couldn't afford their insulin, they also couldn't get the pharmacy to refill their prescription. I told my parents and they were able to get them what they needed, but afterwards I got a reaction from my mother I haven't seen since I was diagnosed. We talked on the phone and she started crying, which made me cry and it never stopped. But you wanna know why she cried? She cried because her daughter is fighting the same battle that those people are. Her daughter is going to turn 26 one day and be on her own. 
Her daughter might have to resort to a Facebook page just to stay alive. Her daughter's life is in the hands of the greedy. But what she didn't know is that her daughter was going to be fighting the fight for affordable insulin and access to emergency insulin to prevent rationing and deaths from DKA. Diabetes does not care what party you affiliate with, how old you are, or what you do for a living. How many more days are we going to let pass until something gets done? How many more deaths is it going to take until we get access to emergency insulin? I don't know about you guys, but it feels like we're running out of time and the diabetics who are rationing their insulin don't have any left. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis, Katie, Jesse. Um, countless stories. Uh, nothing has changed. Uh, the problem is still upon us. The solution sets in front of us. This is an issue of political will at this point in time. I'm calling upon the legislators to come together, conference their pieces of legislation. Since I've been doing every, feels like every week since May, the willingness to call a special session, I've said I will do so, uh, focusing on this and giving the certainty to Minnesotans around uh, access to insulin and life-saving care. So uh, with that, we're open for any questions. Call a special session, they'll bring up Senator Pratt's bill right away. When did he say that? Uh, on Twitter this morning, sir. We have time to tweet, but not to meet. We can't answer a question. Got my cell phone number. Um, doesn't work that you bring up your own bill, and that's the way it's going to go. That bill has issues that were not worked out with the advocates. They were worked out with the insulin companies. I'm more than willing, and I've said I'm willing to compromise. I'm willing to talk about that, but that is not a solution. Uh, that is not a solution for these people. This is not a solution for people who need to have emergency insulin. It's not part of that bill. We can work out where the differences are and willing to compromise, but once again, this is the problem. 16 days since I sent a letter. Answer the letter. Do what the, the House did. Do what we've done publicly. Set on Twitter from afar and tell us you're going to do that. Don't tweet to Katie. Stand in front of them, look these activists in the eye, and work this out together. They've not got a chance to sit at the table to discuss Senator Pratt's bill. So I'm more than willing to get there, but there's a way this is done. It's a conference between the two to reach out the differences, and then we come together. And I am more than willing to do that. Governor, have you formally summoned leaders to your office for a meeting? We've, we've asked for the response, which is the normal way here, to send out the letter to have the conference. We have said we will meet any time. We've asked for that response. We have got a positive response from the speaker, even appointing the people to the conference. We've done so. I have not received any response. I've not received a no. I've not received anything. I'm being told that, unfortunately, appears like the norm is Twitter is the way we respond to people and it's our way or no way. That, that is not how this is done. And I am not going to allow these Minnesotans to get caught in the middle of what is, uh, at this point in time, uh, political foot dragging. We need to get it done. So I'll do it anytime. We'll do it today. We'll meet today if they need to. To the Senate leader's tweet, though, just to confirm, you are not going to call a special session until there's a deal on Correct. emergency and sit down. That's right. That's right. Because it, could you could you read the tweet? What was the what was the tweet exactly? Yeah, right Senator Pratt proposed a great solution to the insulin problem. If the governor calls a special session, I will move to suspend the rules so we can take up Pratt's bill right away. Let's go. That will be no debate on the House bill. That will be no conference ahead of time. That, that's not the way the system works. So we'll conference it out first, then we'll call it. That's the way it's always been done, and that's what they know. This is, again, a solution that's, that's not real. Governor, what do you think is an appropriate compromise between the two sides, between the, the House? Uh, uh, well, certainly the, the we have to make sure that the emergency access is there. I've made it clear that I believe with the the 70 plus billion dollars in profits, there are plenty of profits in, in what the manufacturing costs are for insulin that the, uh, the manufacturers can be part of what helps us pay for this. We can work out and the, the, the solution of having doctors involved in this, that may, you know, that may be uh, a piece that's willing to be there. It's the problem is if you don't have insurance, you have no doctor to get there and that doctor's office is not 
a pharmacy to be able to dispense them. I don't know exactly what the compromise looks like. I've said I'm willing to hear you out. I've looked at both of them. I've signaled that I think the House version, the one that actually, keep in mind, the Senate version was never vetted, there were no hearings, and it's never been voted on. That is much different than the House that had hearings, that was voted on, that was passed and was ready to move forward. So at this point in time, I can't negotiate until they're able to get there, but it's very clear, for some reason, they do not want to conference these things together. Um, they want us to just assume that that's the bill. I have questions. We have questions about the legality of, of the Senate version, and, and I also am deeply concerned that the vehicle and the mechanism for uh, furthering their piece of legislation is the Minsure system, which they have a stated platform to close and shut down. So how do you have both that you want to get rid of Minsure at the same time you want to use that as the vehicle to do this. That is not security. So I don't know at this point where those, those points of compromise is. I have stated uh, where I believe is the best way, but I'm open. I'm open to negotiating what that might look like, but I can't get a response and I can't get them to sit at the table. The House bill would have the pharmaceutical companies pay a fee. The Senate would have them uh, give free insulin, which they at least seem to be a little bit more amenable to. Can this work without having them pay a fee, the pharmaceutical companies? No, they're going to pay something in this. It, it cannot. They're not. We're not going to do more on that. Um, they certainly have the profits are there. They're going to be a part of the solution. It's the same argument we had. It just took a year for the opioid manufacturers to recognize that they were going to pay because they helped create this. This is a situation where there is no one saying that these fees will make any sense in terms of what the manufacturing costs are and everything else. They have a captive audience that simply has to pay for this. So no, they're going to be part of the solution. Can, can you, Governor, however, get this moving forward given the intransigence of the Senate Republicans without perhaps um, dropping the fee out of the equation at least at this point? Well, that's what we yet to be seen. I don't know until we sit down together. Um, I don't know until we see, uh, see what a compromise looks like. I'm going to make my case again. I sure wish there were Data Practices Act to know who's talking to pharmaceutical companies. Because if you ask me, you'll know if I am or not. If you ask me, you'll know who I'm talking to. If you ask me, you'll know what my agencies are saying to one another. Um, of course, I don't know. I, I can't tell what's happening in the legislature of why they're not meeting with the advocates, why they're not meeting with the farm, uh, anybody other than the pharmaceutical companies, and all of a sudden we have a bill that appears to be very friendly to the pharmaceutical companies. So I'm, I'm frustrated at this point, but I'm not closing the door to say, come and sit down. I haven't even got a chance to negotiate what that looks like. I've stated my position, which I think we need to do, but this is a case of put out a plan and then, I don't know, go fishing. I don't know where they're at. I, I, apparently they have cell service because they're able to tweet, but they're not here and they're not coming together. Governor, you um, have to deal with the emergency issue that's in front of you, but the broader issue is price and the increases in price and the affordability for every uh, diabetic who's trying to get these supply. Anything the state can do to... to well, we tried, and you're right, and uh, Peter's right about this. It's the broader issue of, uh, of, of pharmaceutical costs. We know that in Congress and the House, as I saw today, is dealing with that, some of the changes on, on price affordability of pharmaceuticals in general. Uh, if you recall, our One Care proposal made sure that every single Minnesotan would have access to a public option, a platinum affordable plan that included pharmaceutical benefit in there. That was a solution long term to go across from insulin to everything else that was needed. So uh, we are thinking that way. We are looking that way. I have to triage this the short term. I have to triage this for right now. And that's why I think uh, Representative Howard's bill really did deal with the crisis that's in front of us. It dealt with it in a way that made sure that every Minnesotan, regardless of their status of insured or uninsured, whether they were 24 or 33, um, would still have affordable access to it. So I, I'm focusing on that. Um, we've talked about it. it. It's been set up. I, a lot of times I think there's, there's many sides to a lot of stories, but, but I just want to be clear. We have a proposal from the House. We have a commitment from this office. We've agreed to sit down and work out our differences, potentially compromising. And the Republican Senate has said no to a meeting. In fact, they haven't even said no, they just don't respond. And now apparently the response is, we're not willing to do that. You take our bill or nothing. Um, the advocates certainly aren't for that. The advocates aren't standing with them. They have not been included. The special session seems very unlikely by this point. I'm wondering if you're losing confidence that come the 2020 regular session, there will be any action. 
Well, they're giving me no confidence that they're interested in solving this, so I, I think that's probably a fairly fair assumption at this time. But be very clear, there, there's one bottleneck and one reason that we're not compromising and working out the differences, and that's the intransigence of uh, Senate Republicans of unwillingness to talk about it. We have got to talk about it to find out where the difference is, and they're deciding that they're not going to do it. I, I, you may be right. Why would they do it anymore next year? And what you heard um, from Katie and Alexis is that we started this, this is a matter of time. It's not time to be cute thinking about a 2020 election. We are going to lose somebody by the time we meet together that could have been avoidable. That's simply unconscionable. And I, uh, I continue to come here and uh, again, our system of separation of powers is exactly the way it should be. I do not solely possess the power to do this on my own. What I do possess is the ability to use this office to continue to advocate for Minnesotans who simply want life-saving drugs. So at this point in time, I'm gonna make another appeal and that clock will continue to start. I'm asking them today to sit down together to look at the Senate bill, look at the Howard bill and the House bill, see if there's a compromise there. We have put our commissioner and our representatives from my office uh, already assigned to that. Give us some names and let's work it out. We've got to wrap up here. Would it be helpful if the speakers said and spelled their names? Sure. Yes. Okay. Would you guys mind just spelling their names so they can report it? Katie Scott, K-A-T-I-E-S-C-O-T-T. -T. Alexis Stanley, A-L-E-X-I-S. S-T-A-N-L-E-Y. Hello, I'm Jessica Frelich, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-F-R-O-E-L-I-C-H. Thank you. And the governor can stick around for some general Q&A, but I know we've got to wrap up on this piece. Super. Governor, you uh, served in Congress with Representative Elijah Cummings. Do you have any words on this Yeah, as we, thank you guys yeah. as you go on. We appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Oops, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I woke up early this morning and got the news um, of, uh, of Elijah's death. Um, Congress is, again, I, the public sees it, and these are almost like one-dimensional figures that you see. Uh, for those of us who have the privilege of serving there, they're co-workers. There's like fellow teachers, fellow journalists, and uh, you develop friendships, some stronger than with others. Uh, Elijah Cummings was... Uh, one of those bigger than life personalities. He uh, took time out to care, and when you get to Congress, it's very strange. It's a job that you've never done. Nothing really prepares you to understand the workings of it, but you have somebody like Elijah that I think the word I'm, I'm hearing some people say, and it's the first word that came to my mind, he was a mentor to so many of us, and, and I was particularly drawn to him. Those You've all heard him speak, just a passion that, about the issues and a fierce uh, love of Baltimore and of, of social justice. So I feel, um, I feel personal loss. Uh, Elijah was the members of Congress. There's some that would be, my daughter was, uh, was five and my son was newborn when we went to Congress and uh, you take them to the floor kind of bragging in the opportunity and that, that irritates some members of Congress. Uh, then there's people like Elijah Cummings and I still, in my mind's eye, see him bouncing my daughter on his knee and she, uh, she just adored him. Um, she didn't know who he was, just Elijah. She loved saying the name and she knew who he was. And he was always that one who's on the floor when I'd bring her down there and see. So it's a great loss. Um, I hope the public sees this because Representative Cummings was drawn into some of the drama that seems to surround our current political situation every day. Um, just a giant, just a, a just an intellectual in Congress. He, was, he understood the mechanizations of what moved Congress, but, but just a dear friend and colleague. I, I don't think you'd find a single person, and I would make the case that that's certainly on both sides of the aisle, that is not feeling this loss personally, just bigger than life personality. Governor, you um, talked about your bonding tour yesterday. Uh, the speaker yesterday afternoon, uh, Speaker Hortman, said she'd like to see a $3 billion maximum on a bonding bill. Uh, I suspect the Senate Republicans will not want to go nearly that high, uh, although they've softened their rhetoric a little bit uh, on it. Um, 
is three billion uh, doable as far as you're concerned? Would that be kind of maybe the number that you'd want? Well, first of all, and I, I, we had this discussion last year, if you recall, when we first started negotiations, that there was a uh, an ideological difference how you approach problems. I talked about how you assess where the problem's at, you decide what it's going to cost, and then you put a plan in place to try and a attack that problem. Uh, Senate Republicans said, no, you set a dollar amount and that's all there is no matter what. I think on this that it's really important to see what the needs are. And these are requested not just by state agencies, these are requested by local entities, nonprofits. They range from water treatment plants to uh, critical access bridges. Uh, and of course to the University of Minnesota. So that need that they requested was 5.3 billion. I think Senator Senjum summed it up right as the chair on the Senate side. They've kicked the can down the road for quite some time and there's a lot of pent up need to get these done. I think it's my responsibility, um, and Minnesota ranks at near or at the very top of fiscal responsibility with our reserves, with our AAA bond rating. We have the capacity to borrow about 3.1 billion. Um, I think I'm, uh, my take is, is we'll look at this and see again, knock on wood, it looks like our, our November revenues will come in where they need to be, replenishing and shoring up for what will be an inevitable downturn in the economy at some point. But being clear to people, and this is why I'm more hopeful with Senate Republicans, uh, preserving capital assets and investing in the state's future growth is something that I think is shared. I mean, this is, this is old school Republican philosophy that there are certain things you spend on that make sense when you can get historically low interest rates, keep construction costs down and, and get ahead and a plan on some of these, I think they'll be there. What that actual number is, I proposed last year 1.27. Um, the need's probably a little bit. I think that's probably a starting point where you'll see from us. Um, and the House is certainly, I encourage them to put what they want to put out. Um, remember last year they did that? Remember last year we did that? Remember the Senate never had a single hearing and never put out a single number. So once again, it's not at all different than our insulin discussion on this, but my hope is, is that they're gonna have to go home and talk to folks, talk to their mayors, talk to their city councils. And so we're doing this a little different. Um, we're gonna go out there and we're gonna listen, we're gonna hear for some people. Uh, we're doing something that's never been done. I did this as a member of Congress and it was really successful. We're gonna put who's requesting these projects, what the project is, what the cost, what the scope, what the impact is going to be. And then there's going to be a public comment section um, for folks who say that. And it's, it's fascinating what comes out of that, especially people who live there. So we'll see what that number comes with, but that is our first order of business. Um, I think a, a supplemental budget, budget, if it exists, will be relatively small, using much of that to replenish uh, state reserves. But we were told that we couldn't do bonding in a odd number year, so now we're in an even numbered year. Makes no sense not to fix the roofs that need to be fixed. If, if Governor, the House proposal is getting on for three billion, is that, is that something that you would, would back as a starting point? Well, I can't say now. I gotta see what the projects are and I gotta see where they're at and I think us come together. I, I, I think I, over the last 10 months, it's become pretty clear. I, I tend to be uh, fairly fiscally conservative on what the rainy day funds look like and how much we go. I also realize, and just to be clear, if, if the House or the Senate does what happened last year and we don't bond, that is a very expensive hit to Minnesota. And I also want to be clear, when the bonding agencies look at our credit worthiness, our ability to keep up our facilities weighs into that. It'd be the same thing as you. If you went to try and get credit and the bank said, but your house is falling down. Your house isn't really worth what you say it's worth, so you're not credit worthy. Um, I think Republicans get that. I certainly hope that that their willingness to turn a blind eye to the federal deficit does not start to uh, get into their thinking here of fiscal irresponsibility. This is what we need to do. This bonding year gives us a great opportunity. Governor, given the, the impasse on insulin, are you concerned that uh, an election year session might not produce a bonding bill at all and might not produce much of any uh, results? Well, I think it'd be disingenuous not to say I'm worried about that because I'm not even getting any responses. Um, I think we've seen that uh, 
we didn't hold hearings on, on things, whether it ranged from guns to insulin. Uh, I do worry about that. I think it's my job to get out there, and that's one of the reasons for the bonding tour, to tell Minnesotans exactly what it means to bond or not to bond, what the cost would be, what the cost-benefit analysis is for their community. But I, I do worry about that. The good thing is the check and balances on that is, should they choose to do that, um, in, in, in 12 months, there, there will be a, a correction. That's the way this works. And so I, I think election years are really good because they provide the public with leverage to get some of these things done. So I remain hopeful. I certainly think the possibility is there. That's a choice that they can make. It's a choice they're making right now. They're choosing not to respond to my letters. They're choosing not to conference a bill that everyone knows is the way it should be done. They're choosing to just miss this one. That, that could hold true. I certainly hope not. I'll make the case why that's bad policy for Minnesota, um, and I hope that uh, the clearer heads prevail. We did it last year. Um, we got over that. That could have happened last year. It did not. Uh, I hope again that that's the way we go. Governor, Senator Pratt on Twitter says that he invited your office to engage but hasn't heard back, uh, but he's ready to meet tomorrow on the insulin issue. Any thoughts about that? Is he the lead on this then? Is he ready to go on his bill? Is that been authorized by his leadership? And they're willing to compromise? I don't know about leadership, but that's what he's saying. Tweeting at me again? Yes, or me. Sure. We'll have them. Sure. That's what we want. I would just like to set a norm in Minnesota. We don't legislate by tweet. We conduct our business as professionals do. There have been a letter that's been out there and now trying to do this. We will certainly meet. I would assume now that Senator Pratt has set this up that the conference committee is on. We will have our members from the House there. Um, I don't know. What do we do? Do we tweet back at him how this is going to work? And I will make sure folks have copies of the letter that the governor's office has sent to Senator Gazelka, and I do have to get you on a call in minutes. Okay. So that's not for one more question. Sure. Or I got to get you on your call there at late four. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Everybody. Appreciate it.